Hello everyone, and welcome back to Planescape Torment. So, we're here right now in the Civic uh, Fest Hall, All right. with not a lot of leads. So, ah uh, yeah. Guess this is the crooked. So I'm gonna listen to some of this stuff. The squat, hunched old man still has the broad shoulders and scarred, calloused hands of a worker or warrior. An aura of weary despair seems to hang about him. He appears to be giving a lecture at the moment. Stay for it. Right. Oh, hold on. Right, now listen up. This is the seminar on the war. If, you, if you're here to listen about the Blood War, take root. If you're not, you're in the wrong hall, and I'd and you best, best ump your soft, comfort-loving, sigillian limber stems out of here. A Blood War? More boring than listening to a governor recite laws. Let's find some young sensates who need to be indoctrinated in the ways of passion. He waggles his, his eyebrows in anticipation. Ignore more. Keep listening. The man suddenly throws a dark eye over the audience as if looking for something. And further, if you're Tanari or Batezu, ump your slidey, scaly eyes out the door. I was not letting your ornery bastards bend an ear to this and then listen to your barmy arguments. Because this is no discussion on who's right. Behind you, you hear the sounds of something large leaving the lecture hall. It just tells the blood war from the human point of view. It's not promoting one side or another because they both stink in different ways. The speaker becomes somber. So, what's left of, of you wanting to listen to some Blood War stories, tales about the war? Here to hear the horror of it all, no doubt. The float in fortresses wove and weaved a human skin. The planet, plains wide battlegrounds, the Blood War be fought on. He bears his yellow teeth. Tales of fiends locking fangs with other fiends. Grosh, snar. The snarl fades, and he looks suddenly bored. Well, let me peel back your lids and crack your bone boxes. It's all steam and heap of barmy nonsense to be dwelling on that forged dung. He spits in derision, rolling his eyes wildly. I'll tell you this, though. You can't imagine the scale the Blood Wars fought on. Nothing you've seen or heard or participated in. Nothing compares. Time, numbers of legions, sheer bloodshed. Nothing compares, Burks. To try and imagine it, forget it. My advice? Simple. Stay away from the big bloody mess altogether. The only thing he needs to know is this. Fiends are killing fiends. Batezu are slaughtering Tanari. Tanari are butchering Batezu. Right now, he spits again. Neither's winning. Don't think either can't win. Biggest stalemate this side of eternity. Thank the powers. That's it. He shrugs. That's it. I'll be answering any questions you got for me now. What's your question, Cutter? What started the Blood War? You got a right to be curious what started this big old sodden soupy mess in the first place. What set the fiends to lock and horns in the first place, biting and clawing at each other? Until that was the only reason they were alive. Go on. Simple. They met. Besides, Tanari and Bezu, Batezu crossed each other one day, and like two drunken bigots, they set to fighting. That simple. He frowns. Well, go on. Nah, pike that. Imagine two drunken priests who believe each knows the only way to live. Now make those priests ripped with scales and fangs and horns and a cruel streak seven leagues wide and put them in an itty bitty sodden cell, and you have a good idea of the love that can spring forth. And there you have it, the origin of the Blood War. Why are two evil races fighting? One believes evil should be nice and orderly, one believes evil should be chaos, running rampant across the plains. Both evil, but doesn't mean they can't uh, they can agree on anything. Bad blood, bad blood. Each wants to exterminate the other, so only their brand of evil remains. They hate each other. Like like Go on. He brings his hands together, trying to find the right words. You see, they don't hate like we hate. We don't even know what hate is. We have one, one word for hate. They have, his voice drops, 
Thousands upon thousands, their minions twisted and piled like bodies. That's why they fight. How does one get hired into the Blood War? You know, every once in a while, some leather-headed Burt comes around asking about a job in the Blood War. They want some jink, they want a quick stint, and then to get along with their lives. Mayhaps I was one of these leatherheads. Mayhap I was a soul sword, and heard there was a little jink to be made in the war. Got me interested. Go on. Taught me a lesson, it did. We're like ants running around the heels of dance and sodpike gods. I saw a big man who claimed to be big soldiers. He shakes his head. Paper soldiers. War's a furnace for them. Makes them wake up or burn. So how'd you survive the blood war? The man's face darkens. I... Well, that's the one thing I won't speak of, Cutter. Suffice to say, a man does what he has to do to escape the war. Oh god, this is gonna be fun. But a woman named Vrishika told me you had to murder your own men to escape the war. The man's face becomes red with anger. Watch your mouth, Cutter. That's a lie. Foul lie. Foul, foul lie. Are you by me, John, with a fiend over the war and believing her, believing her every word of it? What happened, then? I'll tell you what happened, Burke. He sighs and calms down slightly. I was part of the company of the Blaze and Effigy. A part of its original number was 53 mortal mercenaries, though only nine of us remained. Camped somewhere in Avernus, we were awaiting reinforcements for the next battle. Well, my tour was nearly done then. In fact, I was to leave after that battle. The trouble was, had I died there, I would have been theirs forever. Too much blackness, too much evil in my heart. I would have ended up a petitioner in Bator, an eternal soldier in the war. He shudders at the thought. What happened? Me and two other lads fled like dogs, that's what happened. We scurried across the plain for a handful of days before we came to this great pillar of living heads. An awful, li uh, of living heads, an awful sight. It was. They jabbered and hissed at us, calling for us to come closer. That night I stole away from the others and went to talk to the pillar. And? Gissus shuts his eyes and rubs at his temples. I, I asked this pillar how I might be freed, how I might escape Bator, and it told me in exchange for the two of, two of my brothers. He's quiet for a moment, biting on his knuckles as if fighting back tears. To me, at the time, it was just math. Still sounds like you murdered them, to me. He nods. Not sure I'll ever f uh, if I'll forgive myself. Now, now I'm just a soldier who's looking for a place to die, trying to erase the stain of evil, cleanse my inner gissus before I die and return to the blood war. I lecture here to keep people away from it all, to prevent them from ever having to make a choice like that. That's fine. Right. This is the last bit, then. Some of your sensates says I got one thing to say to you. Don't sign up to see what the Pike and Blood War is about. Don't be a barmy idiot. Use a sensory stone if you got to know, but stay the hells away from anything to do with the Blood War for real. Tis just not worth it. Tis, for a moment, a look of great, of great pain crosses the man's face. It looks as if he's going to weep. Not worth it at all. That's the end of this session, so farewell. So how'd you survive the blood war again? Uh, guess this is fake dark, face darkens. Pike off, I'll be having no more words with you on that. How does one survive the blood war? Want to know how to survive the blood war? Three things, Cutter. He holds up a maimed hand with only two fingers. Go on. First off, you stay the pike out of it. Secondly, keep yourself the pike and hells out of it. And lastly, stay the bloody pike and sod pike out of it. If any part of the war rolls your way, let your imagination give your bum a kick and run as far and fast as you can. 
If you can't run, then lies really still and pray it passes you by. Pauses for a moment, except there's no place to don't touch and there's almost nowhere she can run to get away from it. If there's nowhere to run, why aren't there fiends fighting in Sigil? Aw, oh, now, Cutter, look. They fought... They have fought here a few times. Sometimes we get a little spillover from the Blood War. war. Our Lady of Pain, bless her steel-ridden heart, puts out the fires. Some of the time, he sneers. There's been times... Some horrifying drizzle on yourself, you're so sodden scared times when they've smashed and burnt and clawed their way through whole sodden city blocks and sigil before she decides to clean house. Clucks his tongue and winks cynically. So she ain't always as keen on stopping the blood wars, it might seem, see? Why don't the fiends just take sigil? He laughs, but it turns into a sputtering cough. Don't get me wrong now, both the Tenari and the Batizzi want Sigil Fierce. Tis the most precious stage and ground in the Pike and Multiverse. The cage is the city of doors. It connects everywhere. You can't ignore it, and if you're serving in the Blood War and want to win, you gotta have it. The man coughs again. Tis just the fiends aren't going to get it while the lady's in charge, tis all. She's tough as nails, her blades will cut you deeper than any fiend's fang. And that knots the fiend's stems like you wouldn't believe. One quiet lady, her hands tucked in her sleeves, holding back the blood war all by herself. He laughs bitterly. The fiends are still loud in sigil? Oh, damnably certain. They can't brawl in the streets too much. So as neutral ground, sigil allows them to rattle their bone boxes without trying to murder each other. Sometimes they'll chat it up with each other here. The peace don't stay that way for long, though. Also, just because they can't butcher each other in the streets don't mean spies, recruitment, and backstabbing don't still go on here. They fight battles with lies and words, Burke. Sometimes tis all in the bluster and blather, and there are safe houses about too, places where they can cool their talents for the next skirmish. And they like to recruit here too, looking for boys fresh off the plains with a little greed in their hearts that they can make part of their glorious army. Stop speaking to peer closely at you. Mayhap they recruited you once, eh, Cutter? You look like you've tasted the war. Perhaps. The war leaves a scar on you, Cutter. You know. And you know you never want to go back. Your temples begin to throb painfully as you consider the man's words. A memory begins to surface. Try and recall the memory. The lecture hall begins to fade from your begins to fade from view as terrible visions begin to seep up from the base of your mind. Visions of a place where seasons are like nothing you've ever felt or heard or tried to shut out. A place where prayers go unheard, falling like stones to the earth. Vein-colored lightning flashes across things that were once sky, but now boil beneath your feet and scream when you brush against them. Continue. You run at the head of a large band of men, passing through dark canyons where the walls quiver moistly and beat like a heart, wearing only your own blood as clothing. At last you stand in a place where the ashen gray terrain slithers like a ma mass of snakes, coiling around your ankles and whispering your evil to the earth. You march endlessly, silently, through this colorless land, where fatigue seems to live, and hunt you like shade over the wastes, whipping you with despair. In time, you and the ragged men who follow you come upon a hag, sitting upon a mound of gigantic writhing larvae, poking at one of the slime-covered things with a broken talon. You indicate for one of the men to run forward and speak with her. The hag's grating voice carries to your ears. I would speak with him, she said, then cackled. Her eyes gleam as she points you out to the man. The handsome one that leads your ragged column. I would speak with him. And that is all you can recall. Cutter, you feeling all right there? Yes, uh, I'm fine. So do the fiends recruit often? He nods grimly. Be sure of that. Sigil's the best source of fodder on the plains. He eats milk and planets, so all their prime inhabitants. Too much work. Got any more advice on surviving the war? Aye, whatever he does, don't talk about the blood war with any fiend, or any deva, or archon for that matter. Just don't talk about it, period, because you never know who the hells you're really chatting with. And all of them get mighty touchy when you bring up the war. It's their reason for living. Anything else? He nods, maybe don't go through any portal unless you're piking sure you know where it goes. Maybe you haven't heard tales of clueless planeswalkers stepping through a portal and ending up smack dab in the middle of a blood war skirmish. Know why you haven't heard of them? Because those sods are dead, dead, dead. 
and whatever he does, never sign on for a tour of duty, no matter how much jink they flash in your mug. Certain death and signing on for a tour in the Blood War are the same thing, Cutter. Why is that? Chances are when you sign up, they peel you, so your tour of duty is till time itself grinds to a halt. Even death wouldn't be a release, because then you sink into the lower planes and get dredged back up as something worse than you were before. Then they got their talons on you for all eternity. How would you get out of a tour contract? Hey, hold on. Sweetie, sweetie, sweetie. Unless they don't want you, you don't have much chance. I never heard of it being done with mean-spirited recruits or somebody they really wanted to keep their talons on. Outwitting a Tenari is risky, but, you can't, but can be done. The Batezu are much more dangerous with their contracts. If you sign one of those, you're damned for life. You might try a little garnish, try and dob them, and they might let you make a run for it. But where would you go? There are so many hells. And dying in the Blood War would be an especially bad thing. If you were evil, sure. If you're good, you'd go to another plane to spend your afterlife. But you'd still be a debtor. Now for me, I still got a lot of evil to wash from me soul. So if I died in the lower planes, they would have had me lock, stock, and barrel. You go to another play... Uh, plane when you die? Can you explain that? Go talk to that other death lecturer if you want the dark on that. I can't explain it as well as he, though. He's twice the fool and might scald you with hot air roaring from his mouth. No questions. Three planes align. Thin and sharp featured, his yellow skin covered with tattoos, this man looks over the room and its inhabitants with cold black eyes. He appears to be giving a lecture. I am known as Three Planes Aligned, a Githzerai Scholar. If you are here for my lecture, it begins in a few moments. Mort sighs loudly. Come on, Chief, are we really going to stay for this? Ignore Mort. Keep listening. He speaks in a very low, somber tone. Today I shall speak of the power of alignment and belief, and how they shape the planes. First, I shall explain the concept of alignment. Alignment is a descriptor of one's beliefs and how one acts upon those beliefs. At their core, all creatures predominantly behave in one of three ways. With good in their heart, with evil in their heart, or indifference or neutrality in their heart. They predominantly express each of these core behaviors in one of three different ways. In an ordered manner, in a chaotic manner, or in an indifferent neutral manner. Thus, there are nine core elements that one is capable of. The nine alignments, then, are lawful good, neutral good, and chaotic good. Lawful neutral, true neutral, and chaotic neutral, and lawful evil, neutral evil, and chaotic evil. Now I shall speak of the power of alignment and the beliefs it engenders, of how from them the very deities gain strength, and how belief can physically affect one's environments. A deity must have worshippers, for it is the faith of such subjects which gives, which gives them power. As converts are made and more come to believe in a god, the more power that god receives. Conversely, when no one believes in a deity, it withers and dies, joining the corpses of other gods that float on the astral plane. It is thus possible to slay a deity by simply forgetting about them. 
A much more striking example of the power of alignment and belief, however, can be seen within the sliding of gate towns. First, though, I would define gate towns. Gate towns are towns on the outlands, the largely neutral area which Sigil spins over the center of. They're called gate towns because they are built around a permanent gate or portal to one of the outer planes. Each of these outer planes has its own alignment. The Abyss is chaotic and evil. Batar is lawful and evil. Mechanus is lawful neutral. Mount Celestia is lawful and good. The Atlans, again, are true neutral, leading to neither law nor chaos. Sliding occurs when there is a high concentration of belief in an area of differing belief. When this occurs, the area itself will move, or slide, to a plane that matches the new belief. Now, the gate towns usually have a strong belief that matches the outer plane beyond the portal, but the belief is not yet strong enough for the town to slide from the outlands and into the outer plane. For example, the town of Ribcage borders the portal to the lawful evil plane of Bator. As expected, the residents of Ribcage are largely lawful evil residents, but the entire town's alignment and beliefs are not strong enough so that Ribcage will slide into Bator. For example, Ribcage might one day see the sudden rise of a lawful order, evil order, lawful evil order of clerics, promoting their dark beliefs and converting many citizens to the worship of their lawful evil god. Were this to occur, there would be a good chance that the town would slide off the neutral outlands, becoming part of the lawful evil plane of Bator. Whole layers of planes may move this way. Thus, many wars are wars of belief, in, belief and faith by necessity. They are the tools by which territory is obtained and held. This, then, is the power of alignment and belief to shape the planes. This session has ended. May belief guide your actions and shape the planes to your will. Farewell, all of you. Death's Advocate. Okay, this is the guy. Sigillians, welcome. Please take your seats and listen to the darks of which I speak. Darks, give me a break. We're not really going to listen to this rival trap, are we? Come on, let's go find some sensate chits that have never had the pleasure of sensation of tasting the fiery passion of a skull's lips. He waggles eyebrows in, participation, in anticipation. Ignore Mort. He begins speaking with a somber tone. Death. It is what awaits you at the end of life's journey. He coughs slightly, then raises his eyebrows dramatically, waving his hands at the same time. Death is not an end, but a beginning. Mort whispers, the beginning of more suffering. Mort, quiet down. When you die, you shall not cease to exist, no. Far from it. The outer planes shall welcome you to their breasts. There, a new life... One such as you have never known awaits you there. That's for sure. Or be quiet. You shall cast away the tattered cloak of this life and become one of the faithful, a petitioner. As a petitioner on this outer plane, your life's journey shall truly begin. If you have been a goodly sort of gentleman, steadfast in charity and goodwill towards your fellow bloods, perhaps the light blanketed slopes of Mount Celestia shall house you when you die. Your spirit shall pass on to this place. Willing as a petitioner in the beauty of golden morning, soft sunlight that caresses, sighs dreamily. And eternal boredom. Ignore him. Perhaps you lived your life to betray others and get ahead, giving lies instead of truths, backstabbing others all to accomplish your own goals. Cold, blood-red carceri, the plane where all turncoats fall when they pass on shall be the cage that imprisons you. As a petitioner on this plane, you shall live a life of treachery and treacheries, of lies and lying, knowing a life without trust. Looks like we know where we're both going to end up when we die. He hunches over, his eyes dart back and forth. And perhaps you have lived a life of bloodthirsty evil, contemptuous of your fellow man, laying others low and doing as you please without care for who or what you hurt. Then it is perhaps one of the lower planes, Bator, or the chaotic swirling layers of the abyss that shall welcome you. Evil to the core are the spirits that come to this plane, and most are doomed to mindless cruelty and suffering or servitude in the dreaded, he whispers dramatically, blood war. And that's if you're lucky. That's enough, Mort. No matter where you go, know this, you shall be embarking on a new life. A new life, my Sigillians. And that's supposed to be an incentive? We get to do this all again? 
Gee, I just can't wait to be a floating skull all over again. Wait, Pikin, what a tard. Spoken just like someone who hasn't died before, huh? Come on, Lord, quiet. You shall be able to start anew without the burden of memory or your pa of your past life. Your sole goal, if you will, he smiles at his own humor, is to merge with this new plane that you are on, becoming one with the ideals and the very substance of the plane itself. You shall be one of the inhabitants, the petitioners on this plane, or ideally, one of the building blocks a bit upon which the plane is built. It is the goal of all petitioners. You must, to accomplish this goal, you, claps his hands together for emphasis, must hold to your ideals. Oh, this is one big steaming load. Or quiet down. Your ideals, good or evil, law or chaos, are somewhere in between. As you approach the alignment of the plane, your journey will end as you become part of the plane itself. Tis a glorious existence, my Sigillians. And that is what awaits you after death, my audience. Have a care as to how you live your life, but know that it is not oblivion that awaits you after this life. Mort says aloud, what wash? The speaker's head turns to face Mort, frowning slightly. He leans out, trying to see who spoke. A question? A question for one of the living, perhaps? Mort ducks below the lecturer's field of view, then turns to you and whispers, Go ahead, chief. Tell him the dark of it. Yes, I have a question. He indicates for you to continue. What if someone... can't die? He laughs. Nonsense. Everyone dies, friend. Even gods die. But suppose that someone can't die. Well then, based on what I've said, he would never reach the Outer Plains and never become a petitioner. I can't die. Oh, truly. Look, everyone, a rare treat. One of the great immortals has graced us with his presence. Greetings, O oh immortal. The audience laughs. I can prove it. Oh, do, do. There is more laughter from the audience. What sport? Take heed, my audience. I think we shall have a rare display of my lecture today. Come up here, O oh immortal, and we shall see who is right and who is dead. Kill yourself, then get back up. The speaker turns white at this, taking a step back. By the powers. I think it's only fair that you prove your point now. Eh? The audience watches in morbid fascination. Well, now, go on. Die. Here. Now. Prove your words to be true. Embrace your life as a petitioner. He gulps. Now, uh, hmm. He offers weakly. I must confess that I'm not quite ready to depart this life just yet. Make a motion to kill him, stopping just short of his neck. The speaker flinches, clasping his eyes shut and screeching. You hear a drizzling sound as he soils himself. So, this great new life on the Outer Plains may not be all it's supposed to be. The speaker is aware of his hypocrisy, but is afraid of the alternative. Perhaps not. <laughs> he, qu he glances quickly at the audience. Eh, well, certainly not now. As I thought, I had another question. Why do petitioners lose their memories? He raises an eyebrow. Any pardons? What? I said, why do petitioners lose their memories when they die? He looks uncomfortable. Uh, well, you know, who wishes to be burdened with such things as memories? The audience murmurs. But why do they lose their memories? I... He frowns, begins to say something that stops. After a moment, he continues, choosing his words carefully. I imagine that it is because you must start afresh. Your petitioner soul pure when you arrive on your new plane. And why should you have to do that when all your life experience says have determined what plane you end up on. He looks very uncomfortable. Well, I... He pauses. I don't know. That's no answer. He becomes slightly angry. Do you have a better answer, my friend? Perhaps one you can share? The audience turns to face you. I don't remember where or when, but I seem to recall having heard that memories drift on the astral plane as memory cores. The 
the speaker turns to face the audience. An audience member shouts out, He's right. The speaker turns to face the audience member. Eh, well, perhaps he is. Well, then the question becomes, is a lifetime of memories more important than living life again? Yes. He says angrily. Then it's simple enough. Don't die, friend. The audience chuckles. Can a petitioner die? He looks slightly uncomfortable at this. Well, yes. What happens when they die? He looks a little more uncomfortable. Well, you merge with the plane. What if the petitioner dies on a plane other than their home plane? He looks very uncomfortable. He looks... He looks very uncomfortable. Uh, well, then that is the end of life there. Um, but no petitioner wants to leave their home plane, friend. He looks around, realizing he's in trap. To do so would uh, be oblivion should they die, really. Hmm, another question. No questions. If there are no more questions... He looks eager to wrap things up, then I shall end this session. Um, I shall continue to lecture here at the hall, so, uh, tell all your friends. Someone in the audience shouts. Sure, so they can come see you mess your tunic again. The room fills with laughter. Eh. Ahem. see unfulfilled desire who seems to collect her feet upon the desires of others removing them forever from their mind she smiles when she sees you I had some questions she frowns looking away from you in a mo for a moment knowledge such a thing I do not seek to deal in surely you have some other want some other need you can speak to me of no I don't think I'll be sharing those with you farewell This person uh, turns as you interrupt them, nodding a polite greeting. Apologies, good sir, but I was just in the middle of something. If you don't mind, farewell. They give a polite half bow and make to continue about their business. Splinter regards you coolly as ever as you approach. 
We welcome you once more to the Civic Fest Hall, Traveler. How may we help you? I had some questions. We will be pleased to answer what questions we can, so long as they pertain to the Fest Hall or the Society of Sensation. Someone I was looking for here. Merriman. Merriman is usually pacing back and forth around the lecture halls. Travel through the middle door. Okay. Is there anyone here who might know about Ravel Puzzle well? Splinter closes his eyes and thinks briefly. We would recommend that you speak to a wizard by the name of Quell. Oh, about Ravel. Quell is always somewhere in the Fest Hall, most often in the private sensorium. Show me to the private sensorium. Done. Oh. Let me hear what he had to say again. Uh, we do many things in this fine hall, traveler. We answer questions guests might have regarding it or its inhabitants. We direct both visitors and members of the Society of Sensation alike to the sensoriums or lecture halls. We also accept new members into the Society. Lastly, it is through us that purchases from the Society's vaults are made, spells, items, and such. Can you show me to the sensoriums? There are two. The public sensorium, where visitors may use the sensory stones for anywhere between 10 and 50 commons, and the private sensorium, where only members of the Society of Sensation are allowed. You can reach neither of them yourself. We must take you there. Uh, public sensorium. All right. Is an unusual bluish purple stone. It is securely fastened to the pedestal. Ooh, you have a name. Lady Thorncomb. This comely middle aged woman is wandering about dreaming dreamily. Absent-mindedly chewing, chewing on her thumbnail, her eyes seem focused on nothing in particular. She is dressed in elegant yet disheveled finery, and her hair is slightly tussled. Greetings. Hmm? She takes her thumb from her mouth, smoothing back a strand of hair that had fallen in front of her eyes. I had some questions. Very well, ask what you wish. She sounds apathetic. Questions about you. As you begin to ask your question, you realize she's not looking at you, let alone paying you any attention. Any attention? Hello? I had a question. Very well, ask what you wish. She sounds apathetic. Questions about this place. Never mind. This man's gentle voice compliments his calm and refined demeanor. Greetings, are you here to use one of the sensory stones? Yes. 
which one of these will suit you. Will one of these suit you? Uh... Supernatural Lust will do. Good choice. The stone you shall want to use is in one of the smaller chambers. Seven rooms clockwise from the stairwell. It is light blue in color. Two, four, five, six, seven. There we go. This light blue stone is the one that the clerk directed you towards. Within it lies the experience supernatural lust. Find yourself coupling with a succubus, a creature of such intense otherworldly beauty that even her fiend's horns and thrashing tail give you no pause. She gasps under you. You desire her so completely that the whole of your existence seems focused towards this single goal. As your life explodes from you in a starry burst, you hear the delighted laughter of the succubus as she drains you dry, leaving your body but a soulless husk. Stir yourself from the experience. The experience seems to have stirred some long-forgotten vaguely similar memory in your own mind. You feel as if you've gained something from using the sensory stone. And some questions. May now is this okay? Does this answer your questions? No. Uh Okay. Mind numbing. Uh, unavoidable pain will do. Good. The stone you shall want to use is in one of the smaller chambers, one room clockwise from the stairwell. The experience is a short and violent one, struggling with another, slightly stronger man on the edge of a blazing hot stream of molten lava. Your weapon hand is slowly and inex inexorably forced ever closer to the magma. Beads of sweat evaporate the instant they appear. The hair on the back of your hand blackens and smolders above the awesome heat. Finally, your howls of suffering echoing from the canyon walls around you. Your hand on the axe it holds plunges into the lava and chars to ash in a few agonizing seconds. The experience seems to have stirred. Okay. This woman is still meandering about the sensorium, traveling from stone to stone. Questions about you? Okay. Actually, are there others? Man now, it's explaining several sensations that are available for your use. Grim Determination will do. Okay, six rooms clockwise. Done. The entire hall was in ruins and still in the process of being destroyed, as dozens of combatants hurled weapons, deadly arcane magics, and themselves at one another in a desperate struggle to be the last one standing. Plumes of acrid green smoke rose from the pile of... What is this again? Grim determination. Plumes of acrid green smoke rose from the pile of limp bodies you dragged yourself out of, having barely escaped the wrath of some fiendish spell. There it was, across the way, through the battling throng, through the bloodthirsty battle ahead of you, sitting untouched on a miraculously upright table, your pint of mead, and you'd get it back, even if, if you had to kill every last one of the brawling tavern patrons to do it.
private sensorium. I'm gone. Well, there you are. This older man is chewing on something, muttering softly to himself. After a moment, there is a crack as he crunches down on the object in his mouth and swallows it. His bushy, brassy, white eyebrows raise furrow for a moment, rise and then furrow again. Hmm. Greetings. Without so much as looking at you, the man reaches into his tunic, pulls out a puce color ball, regards it curiously for a moment, then pops it into his mouth. I said, greetings. The man frowns and waves you away, then nods to himself thoughtfully as he savors the flavor of whatever he's put into his mouth. I've got some questions. The man smirks, bites his thumb at you, then abruptly pauses. His cheeks swell, and with a violent gag, he spits up a large black fly which begins to buzz around the chamber. Menace. Men erosion candles be damned. Cries, shaking his fist at the insect, he whirls on you. What? What do you know of Ravel Puzzle well? Pops a small red candy into his mouth. Do you always traipse about molesting puissant mages with your ignorant prattle? Babbling, blathering, chittering, chattering. The candy shoots from his mouth on chattering, flying at a high arc to land on the floor with a wet plip. He stares at it sadly. My question? Or... Go out on him, pick it up and eat it. You snatch up the candy and pop it in your mouth. Its taste is sweet and tangy. The mage's jaw drops. My, my delectably scrumptious bitopian fruit candy. That was good. Can I have another? Another one? Another one? Of all the raw, blistering nerve. What makes you think you deserve another candy, you unmannerly, churlish dullard? I don't deserve one. I want one. Now let's have it. How dare you so ungraciously demand candy of me, as if it were some divine right granted to you by the greatest of powers. Shall I just kneel to this whim of yours, O great one? Pass my treasured candies on. Oh wait, they weren't candles, they were min erosion candies. Okay. Shall pass my treasured candies on to your stigmated sacredness? Why don't I anoint them with precious oils? Have them blessed first. He stomps his foot with each word. Oh, no, no. I think not. Fine, then. Forget it. I shall. Forgotten. Forgotten it is, you scabrous rock baited clattered trap. Now, farewell. But I had some questions. I care not, you yeasty beef-witted beef pig nut. His eyes bulge out. And he jabs his finger at you. Now, off with you. Off with you, and do not return without being prepared to show the proper respect. Come bearing tribute, a gift. He suddenly draws clothes and whispers from the side of his mouth. Candies or chocolate would be nice, but nothing common, mind you. Bring something exotic. Now, be gone. Fine, I'll look around the world for something suitable, Updated then. Updated my journal. Wait, um... The messenger. Longing. A curious looking building, to say the least. Let's see your merchandise. Ch -ch -ch. 
front of the store, I think. Chocolate closet. Okay, yeah. I'll take it. Yes, Frischka purrs. A wise choice. Okay. Farewell. Hmm. Done. Fifteen hundred. Jesus, I don't have that much. Done. What lectures are there to attend? Hmm. The mage's expression curdles as he spies your approach. Unbelievable. You've chosen to curse me with your detestable presence once more, you ill-conceived reeky sod. He pauses his harangue to eat a small peppermint. I pray you've learned yourself some manners. I brought you some imported chocolate as a gift. Oh, his demeanor changes in an instant. Very kind of you, very gentlemanly. May I see? Show him the chocolate closet. He takes it from your hands. Oh, quite rare these are, and most delectable. He bites off a large piece and tucks what's left into his tunic. Alright, add some questions. He frowns at you, licking the last of the chocolate off his fingers. Who told you to bother me with inane questions? He stares at you accusingly. Come now, what is it that you want, wish to bother me with, or be gone? He fishes a malt ball from his sleeve and eats it. What do you know of Ravel Puzzlewell? At the mention of her name, he swallows the candy he's sucking on with a loud gulp, wincing in pain. What to tell? Why tell at all? Such things, such tales are best left in dusty books and in the antics of old men's minds. Evil, evil, such a name, such a name, and such dark tales swarm about it like flies on a corpse. Just the same, I need you to tell me. He rolls his eyes, plopping another candy to his mouth. She's a night hag, my boy came to sigil all evils and cackles she was alive with her shadow magic ready to butt heads with the lady of pain barmy 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 old hag only succeeded in succeeding in getting herself mazed she's likely dead by now how might i find her how might you what his candy rolls right out of his mouth and onto the tiles before you can so much as look at it he snatches it up and pops it back into his mouth giving you a dirty look why why would you ask such a thing are you mad what could you possibly want with such an evil creature? She knows something about my past. Doubtful. She was mazed many centuries ago. Gone. Penned in the dead book she is. And even if she were, some why, somehow, still clutching to life with her black and bloody talons. What could she possibly know about you? If she wasn't the spitting image of cackling evil, that is, and was even willing to help you, I'll just have to hope she's alive and will help me. By Lesh's six teeth and her swollen tummy, what a flickering candle of hope curled into the howling winds of pandemonium, that is. Flicker, flicker, whoosh. Don't be any more of a fool than you need to be. I must still seek her out, whether she's dead or alive. So if she's dead, as she most likely is, then what is your plan, may I ask? You have everything all figured out, do you? 
well as just blowing words out of his pits. Nonsense. Nothing. What do you plan to do if she's in the dead book, huh? Eh? I don't know. I'll figure something out. My, my, my. That's the best plan I've ever heard. Pure, blinding, white genius of an idea. No idea how to get into the maze. No idea how to get out. No idea what to do if she's dead. Certainly no idea what to do if she's alive. I might as well be talking to a lemur for all the barmishly fool barmy foolishness you're spouting out. Can you tell me how to get to her maze? Lunatic, madman, Edelcove, have you not listened to a word I've said? She's imprisoned in an interdimensional maze for trying to best the Lady of Pain. That means she's at least ten times as barmy as you and at least a hundred times more powerful. She's also most likely dead, 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 Bryce dead, and if by some happenstance she isn't, she'll make you dead. I understand, but I really need your help. Can you tell me how to reach her or not? Quell goes quiet, chewing on his lip. After a moment, he fishes around in his tunic for a minute, then plops it into his mouth. You're serious? Serious now? Why so serious? So bet or... Why so serious? So bet or bent, so mule stubborn. He sighs. Well, born clueless, die clueless. Updated my job. Yes. All mazes have portals. This much I know to be true. A way in, a way out. This is how the lady fashions them. I do not know the portal, its location or even its form, but I am told that its key is a piece of Ravel. A piece of Ravel? But if Ravel is a maze, then how am I supposed to... Then you'll have to make do. Find something that has Ravel's taint in it, mayhap. That is all I know. All. Bother me no more about it. If you want to go pestering someone about something like that, go to the brothel slating intellectual lust. One of the ladies there is bound to have met someone or knows something that'll help. My thanks for your help. Updated my journal. Farewell. Okay. Questions? Uh, I wanted to ask about you. There is little to say we haven't... We have not told you. We are the Splinter, doorman to the Fest Hall, demigod son of Issachar and priest king of Ur. Plane walkers came to our world and told us of the Society of Sensation. We were fascinated and returned with them. We left Ur in the capable hands of our queen, so that we might come to this place and experience servitude and humility for a time. As time does not pass here as it does in Ur, the century we have spent here will be as a mere several months in our own world. After another decade or so, we imagine we shall be ready to return to Ur and rule it once more. Uh, updated my journal. We would recommend that you speak to one known as Salabesh. Okay. No, oh, negative token. Where did I get this? This is a negative token. A flat, black disc that appears to have no substance to it at all. Turning it over reveals that it has no third dimension. There is no thickness to this item at all. It gives you some command over creatures of shadow. You can command them to stand still for a few precious seconds. The more powerful the shadow, the less likely it will obey your command. As an added benefit, as long as this token is carried by any of your party members, it acts as a ward against shadows. It will not prevent shadows from attacking a group. The shadows will find it more difficult to harm you while the token is carried.
The young woman refuses to say another word to you. Toady nobleman sneers as you approach him but says nothing. Greetings. He makes a point of ignoring you. Done. God like damn it.
This tall, slender woman, sipping wine from a small ceramic cup, appears to be looking for someone. Her facial features are elegantly exotic, and the woman's ears, though partially covered by her long hair, can be seen to come to sharp points. Greetings. The woman turns to face you, violet eyes flashing like flawless chips of amethyst. Her speech is as music. You can hear a faint musical tinkling. A hundred tiny crystal bells as she speaks. Each word lingers in your ears as if they were unwilling to relinquish the exquisite sound. Amel turned to face the scarred dour stranger. She asked what he wished of her. Wow. Ha! Anna sneers at Mort. Stop your drool and your leering skull. My, what a hot-blooded little chit. Starve for attention? I could drool over you too if you're just jealous. Mort starts floating towards Anna, making what slavering noises. Get a hair's breadth closer, Skull, and I'll see to it that not one of your chattering teeth lies within a hundred paces of another. Mort stops abruptly, turning away while muttering unintelligibly. Your Namel, I was told you know the command word for this decanter. The woman makes no move to touch or examine the decanter, but only speaks. Namel took it from the stranger, turning it in her hands. Had she seen it like before, she thought? Perhaps. Yes. You remember now. She returned the decanter, whispering into his ear as she did so. Updated uh, my journal. You realize you know the word now. Build the no sag, though you're certain the woman never whispered to you, but merely said she did. She blinks at you. Would the stranger leave her now, satisfied with what she had told him? Not yet. Your friend Aylwin is Updated looking for you. Updated my journal. Namel's lips form a perfect smile, and infectious happiness radiates from her, clinging to you like sweet-smelling warmth. Mel was overjoyed to hear of her friend. Was Aylwin close by? He's at another cafe east of here, across this part of the ward. Mel thanked the man for his wondrous news. Soon she would go to visit her oldest friend Aylwin. Now, though, she would reward the stranger. Wait for her to reward you. She would draw the stranger close, laying her hand upon his chest and kissing the pale, leathery skin of his cheek. Life would flow into him, invigorating him. This, then, was to be his reward. As you wait, there is a light, tingling sensation upon your cheek and chest. The feeling spreads across the whole of your body, and you begin to feel stronger, more animated. Thanks, I had some questions. Nemel oh, listened to the stranger's questions, but could answer none. He would have to seek his answers elsewhere. Farewell, then. I'm looking for help. Uh... <sighs> uh, it seemed to have lost my memories. In doing so, I've lost myself. You've been stricken with amnesia? Fall from grace looks pained. How terrible. Do you have any idea how it happened? Not really, at least not that I can remember. I woke up on a slab in the mortuary and everything before that is black. You awoke in the mortuary? I think the dustman mistook me for being dead. Or I was dead. Or something. All I know is that I regenerate wounds quickly. I could be immortal, but I don't even know that for sure. All from Grace seems to be appraising you with renewed interest. Those scars on your body. She reaches out with a hand as if to touch you. May I? Yes. Fall from grace draws your finger drags your finger across your chest lightly, tracing some of the edges of your tracing the edges of your scars and following the curves where they blend into some of your tattoos. She seems fascinated. These scars do look as if they would have taken several lifetimes to accumulate. They certainly do, though some are more recent. Fall from grace steps back. Some of these those wounds would have been fatal to a normal man. She taps her chin, thinking, What do you intend to do now? I need to get my memories back, and my life back. I intend to scour the plains and search inside myself 
until I could piece together who I am and what brought me to this state. Fall from Grace is still thinking, her finger tapping on her chin. I must say, I've never met a man who had lost himself in the literal sense. He raises an eyebrow. Forgive me, but your condition is intriguing. It is that. Fall from Grace nods. If it will help, you are welcome to tour the brothel. Several of our students are well-versed in the verbal arts. Perhaps some of them will be able to rekindle your memories. I may do that. Can I ask you some questions first? Uh, no questions today. Hmm. Give us smells plat pleasantly at you. Greetings again. Have you come to trade tales? No, but I have some questions. Ivis, you look familiar. Is your mother named Yuvana? Ivis nods. Yes, but she and I no longer speak. She says I shall speak no more of her. Okay. I'm trying to find Vivi. I'm trying to find Marissa's Crimson Veil. Do you know where it might be? Ivis shakes her head, but Marissa's is an interesting tale. Would you hear it? Yeah, go ahead. Once upon a time, in a world of heroes and a time of petty childish gods, there were three sisters. First, with a hideous appearance, they were considered demons by the people of the land and forever shunned. One missed her sisters terribly, yet left that world with its shame behind, but exchanged the pettiness of a pantheon for the pettiness of self. Okay. I'm trying to find Vivian's scent. Do you know where I might be? Okay. Let's talk to Nenny again. Well, Matt, good sir. I'm Nenny, and how are you this fine day? Oh, we've met before. Nenny giggles and smiles gleefully at you. I'm sorry, I knew you looked familiar, though. That's all right, Nenny. I had some questions. I'm trying to find Marissa's... Please ask, she smiles giddily. I'm trying to find Marissa's crimson veil. Do you know where Updated it might be? My journal. I'll bet I do. I saw that nasty Kamaxi tongue sneaking out of Marissa's room one night. They're both meanies, you know, but Kimaxi's really awful. Anyway, I talked to her first. Okay. I just need a lead. Well, here you are, looking ugly as ever. Back for some more Kimax Kimaxi abuse, eh? Questions. Tiefling rolls rise. And what makes you think... I care. Why don't you lick my backside? My tongue's not wide enough, and I don't like hair in my mouth. Well, you seem to like the taste of awful in your mouth, you dung-breathed cretin. Only because it's like kissing you, you mangy stinkpot. Kiss me? She makes a retching sound. I'd rather kiss a bloody mask of mass of phlegm than lay my lips on you. No thanks. Don't thank me. Thank the power if someone actually wants to kiss you. Kimaxi looks at a loss for something to say. For an instant, a smile threatens to crack the grimacing mask of her face. Then she begin becomes more of a basilisk than ever. All right, what do you want of me? Questions answered. She looks annoyed. Fine, whatever. Ask. I was told you were seen sneaking away from Marissa's chambers recently. Is that connected with her missing veil somehow? Kimaxi flies into a rage. Who told you that? She suddenly falls silent, glaring at you through narrowed eyes. If I was there, Burke, I didn't take her filthy veil. Search my room if you'd like. I catch you sniffing at my britches, though. I'll see to it that you're never allowed in here again. Why would anyone ever sniff Updated at your britches? My journal. Beats me. Someone's nicked more than a few pair of them. Though, my favorite leather brassiere, too, with the iron studs. She harumphs angrily. Another question. I've been trying to, I'm trying to find Vivian's scent. Do you know where it might be? Try a hive gutter. Perhaps it's just a similar aroma. To be serious, though, Marissa stole it. Marissa, are you sure? No, but I'm hoping you'll go stomping into a room and upset her enough to do something awful to you. All right. Uh, 
Masks, he says someone's been taking things from her room, too. Have you seen Updated anything on my journal? And his eyes suddenly... Hey, no, no, no. Suddenly go wide. Oh, that's right. You know, once I saw a man sneaking out of Kamaxi's room while she was out talking to a patron. Hey, hey. I watched the front doors all that day, but he never, ever left. Isn't that odd? I don't think he could have made it out a window, and so I never figured out where he went. And I totally forgot about it. Weird, huh? Yes. Hmm... I think I have an idea where everything is. All right. You. Sweetie, hey, I need you down. Get in the way. Greetings again. Listen, you shouldn't really be down here. Please don't tarry around too long before heading back upstairs, if you don't mind. I wonder when either of us get into trouble. I had some questions. Uh... Hmm, okay. What did I succeed in taking from him? All right. 
Oh, okay. That's right, it was just a cranium rat charm. Okay, so... I'm gone. Well, there has to be a secret way out of the brothel, then. Oh. I'm gone. Unless the guy... No, I must confess, though, that Mercer frightens me somewhat. I fear that something terrible awaits within her chambers, that she is merely humoring me until she tears me apart. I, for one, will be glad when she has her veil and will meet patrons outside of her darkened room once more. turns as you approach, now it's politely greeting, something I might help you with? I'm trying to find Vivian's scent, do you know where it might be? If he was a thief, could he somehow still be here? As you make to search the armoires, handles suddenly yank out of your grasp as the drawers slam themselves shut. A disdainful humph issues from the cabinet. Hello? Hello indeed. The armoire gives another humph. So what have we here? A rogue after some lady's frilly undergarments? Hmm? Who are you? I am Louis. Louis. And who are you? Thoughtless, uncouth fellow, rummaging about. And other people's things. Never mind that. What are you doing here? Well, sir, if you must know, I am being an armoire. But why are you being an armoire in this brothel? I happen to have become an armoire because I want to be an armoire. Thank you very much. It's not to watch the ladies undressing, nor to have them place their soft sweet-smelling undergarments in my drawers where they can rub against my skin. Such accusations are an insult to a practitioner of the magic arts. I am merely soaking in the experience of what it means to be an armoire. The sights, the smells, the sensations. So the women all... So all the women know about this, then. Yes, yes, they do. And they wholeheartedly approve of... Well, not with their entire hearts, exactly. And while they have not spoken of their approval in my presence... Since they are not exactly aware that I am an armoire, I would not want them to know that I am anything but, and so have not been able to inquire upon the matter. I had some questions for you. Nenny told me she saw a man leaving Kamaxi at her tongue's room. I think that was you, Lewis. You think? Think? How could you be so alarmingly rude, so ludicrously presumptuous as to spout forth such an accusation without being absolutely certain of your charges? How dare you, impertinent brassy cur? Why, I ought to. Does Luis 
As Lewis rails and curses his drawers open and close, he notices a small bundle of crimson cloth tucked alongside some clothes. The repeated opening and closing of the armoire drawers makes it difficult to grab, however. Wait for an opportunity to grab it. You stand poised at the edge of the armoire. It keeps gabbing on and on, but it never seems to stay open long enough for you to grab the cloth. Try and snap your hand in while the drawers open. You simply cannot move your hand quickly enough to snatch the crimson cloth from within Lewis. The most you could accomplish would be getting your fingers crushed. Pull open the drawer to get the cloth. The drawer remains closed. You hear it puffing and wheezing from the exertion. Go away, you barbarian. Pull it open. Uh, give me that crimson cloth, Lewis. Chant. Won't. Never. Beg and whine. Oh, please, stop that rubbish. It is quite tiresome and transcends all no meanings of the word boredom. Give me that crimson cloth. Beg and whine some more. Stop. How tediously dull. You're making me quite drowsy. Keep on begging and whining. The armoire yawns, exposing the crimson cloth where it rests snugly beside some undergarments. You dart your hand in and seize it before the drawer can close itself. Tucking it away, you notice that it is perfumed with a light, exotic, and most pleasant fragrance. Damn it, you rogue. Blackguard scoundrel. You give that back this instant. That's not yours. This is, that is an exceedingly personal garment that belongs to a lady of this establishment, and they would not appreciate you fondling their private things. Oh, but it's alright for you, you wooden pervert. I'm not doing anything so criminal and malicious as you are. I am merely soaking in sensations necessary to my growth as an individual. Yes, yes. Farewell, Lewis. Okay. Mercer's cold, cruel voice hisses from out of the darkness. It returns. You have a reason for coming this time, I trust, or just more of your pointless questions? Actually, I brought your crimson veil. Then would you please hand it over? Of course, here you are. My journal. You hold the crimson veil before you, and you feel her take it from your hands. Ah, yes, much better. Two shining points of red light appear before you as she opens her eyes. Well, that's what you look like. Perhaps I would have been better off with my eyes shut. Watch that forked tongue of yours, Marissa. Do not e get me even started. Alright, question. Vivian sent. Okay. I feel stronger. Your charisma surpasses that of mortal men. Your presence is such that many would lay down their lives just for you. That would lay down their lives for you. the talking armoire. I had some questions, Lewis. An ominous silence hangs over the armoire. There is no reply. You're certain it's still Lewis. You can practically feel the hatred radiating from the wood, but he won't speak a word to you. So long, Lewis.
Wait. Questions? Okay. Did you turn, say, a limb limb into a statue? I suppose I could. Why? Do you happen to be carrying a limb limb? No, not at the moment. Well, then, it's a moot point in any case. By loud. She, shot, she sighs loudly. I'm not quite sure why you even bothered me about it. This is a research journal of a linguist named Finnan. Venom glances your way, frowning. Chosen to grace my home once more? Have you? What is it you wish me this time? Where is that book? Let's see. 
Is it, is it gonna work? Okay. All right, I'll hold on to it. I'm gone. Fight's not working on this thing. Fight's not working on this thing. Fight's not working on it. Hack it up. I'm not going to steal from any of them. Have you had any had you any luck in finding my scent perchance? In a way, I believe it was on Marissa's lost fail, which I returned to her. She has your scent. For the briefest of moments, Vivia's eyes smolder with rage. She does, does she? We shall see about that. Do not move, I shall return shortly. There. That solves that, that hideous witch. Always stealing my perfumes, but never did I think she would have the audacity to steal my own personal scent. <laughs> she suddenly sh she suddenly shakes out her crimson hair in a moment. You were surrounded by the most intensely exotic and arousing scent you have ever had the pleasure of smelling. That smells great. It does, does it not? Vivian's smile suddenly disappears. Well, I suppose you shall be wanting your reward now. Stand closer to me, scarred one. Approach her. You step closer to Vivian. She takes your hand and, turning it over, takes a single cautious sniff of your wrist. Whew! She wrinkles her nose. Vinegar or embalming fluid? Here, I shall remove the smell from you. 
He mutters a few strange syllables, and a light tingling sensation spreads over your skin. In moments, your chemical reek lessens substantially. There, how's that? People should be less eager to avoid conversation with you now. Thanks, Vivian. Farewell. Okay, so just go talk to, uh... Oh, what's her name? Kimaxi, there. Oh, it's you again. Just can't get enough of me, huh? Marissa's red eyes gleam at you from the blackness. Yes, a faint hissing accompanies your query. Hmm. Vivian's personal scent. Oh, okay, okay. to erase Merriman's memory. It's just a water from the river sticks for the task, though I'm not certain where I would find some. Okay, uh... I want to ask about one of the planes you mentioned. The Abyss. A plane of over 600 layers of festering chaos and evil, home to the fiendish Tanari. He gestures dramatically, but you should seek out someone more knowledgeable on the planes than I. Dodecahedron.
This heavy dodecahedron about the size of both your fists balled together seems inexplicably familiar to you. The texture is cold and smooth, but whether it's metal or stone, you cannot tell. A certain, almost intangible tension runs over the object, as if it were ready to spring into the air at any moment. Use. This heavy dode... Okay. Examine the dodecahedron closely. Upon closer examination, you realize that each side of the dodecahedron is a plate that can be twisted clockwise or counterclockwise. It appears to be <coughs> a puzzle box or a combination lock. As each of the pentagonal plates has five possible positions, the dodecahedron is no less than 244,140,625 settings. It would take every second or the next 77 odd years to hit all the combinations. Then again, you might just get lucky and stumble onto a solution in minutes. Fiddle with it for a bit. As you methodically twist the cold gray facets of the dodecahedron, a strange sensation forms at the base of your skull. Your hands seem to move of their own accord, turning the object and spinning its facets with mechanical precision. You've done this before. You knew the combinations once. And you also became, become aware that there's a certain danger within the object. Whether it's from simple traps or something less mundane, though, you cannot recall. Keep working at the dodecahedron. In moments, you have what might be the first four sides locked into their places, proper places. As you begin to twist the fifth side of the dodecahedron, you recall a cunning blade trap that would snap out to lash at a meddler's hands, slashing their wrists and severing fingers. You avoid the trap with the proper number of rotations, certain that you've made progress in the unraveling of the object's secret. Keep working. After avoiding the dodecahedron's spinning, springing blades, you slowly puzzle out the next series of facet positions. As you start to turn the ninth side of the dodecahedron, you suddenly remember a second trap. Jets of toxic gas that would form a billowing cloud of lethal corrosive vapor around a curious meddler. You circumvent the trap with the correct amount of twists, positive that you've nearly unlocked the dodecahedron. You circumvent the dodecahedron's poisonous gas trap and begin your work on the final fast positions. As you, cir you circumvent the uh, and begin your work on the final fast positions. Just as you're locking the 12th pentagon into place, sorceress runes hidden within the dodecahedron unleash a tiny storm of magical lightning. Arcs of crackling blue light run up your arms, leaving smoking trails of black ruined flesh in their wake. After allowing your muscles to cease their spasms and picking yourself back up, you recall how to avoid that trap. After making a final adjustment to the 12th facet, the dodecahedron clicks and begins to open in your hands. The dodecahedron splints once, twice, and eventually unfolds itself impossibly into a perfectly rectangular tablet the size of a large book. Etched into its surface are a series of bizarre symbols. It looks to be a code or language that you feel should be familiar to you, but it's not. Further examination of the tablet reveals that by twisting the pentagonal facets that are now upon the underside of the tablet, different pages may be displayed across the tablet's face. You finally realize that the dodecahedron is a tome or journal of some sort. Until I can learn, until I learn to read this language, I might as well just put it Updated away. Updated my journal. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm gone. I feel like her shop would have 
some water or something from the river stick. She may not know that it's that, but it should... It may be here. Unfold the decahedron to a page, dodecahedron to a page with writing on it, and ask if he could translate it. He takes the unfolded dodecahedron in his hands and examines it closely. This language is a long dead one, known to virtually no one. I believe my father, a linguist like myself, knew this language and may well have been the only man in sigil at the time that could understand it. I recognize it from his notes, but I cannot translate it. Do you have those notes still? Venom shakes his head. They'll be of no use to you if you're looking to translate anything. The few actual books he had pertaining to that language disappeared around the time of his murder, I believe. Your father was murdered? Venom nods. Strangled he was. He had left to tutor someone. He taught various languages to supplement his research income, and was discovered dead in a side chamber of the Civic Fest Hall. The killer was never found. This was some, oh, perhaps fifty years ago now. I was but a child. He knew the language, though, and could teach it? Surely he did, and could, were he alive today. My father was said to be a great teacher. Venom sighs sadly. I have his skill with language, but not his patience for others, sadly. Is he Updated interred at the mortuary? Journal. Why, no, his ashes are kept here. He points to a bronze urn sitting atop a cabinet beside a bouquet of purple flowers. Why? A wry smile crosses Finnum's lips. A necroscope, are you? Speak of the dead. He suddenly frowns. I have no wish to speak of these things any longer. You'll have to excuse me, sir. Farewell. Uh... I very much like to see them just the same. Venom gives an annoyed sigh. I'm not certain where they are just now, and I'm looking for something else at the moment. My research journal. Perhaps when I've recovered it, I could spread the time to find those notes for you. Is it this book Updated right here? My journal. Venom's eyebrows arch. Why, yes it is. He takes it from you, then begins to rummage through his pockets. Here you are, then. My father's notes. Square, then, are we? Good. I have to look over my notes now, If you'll, so if you'll excuse me. Thanks, Finnum. Farewell. Thin and... Okay. These are the notes of the deceased ling linguist Finn and Lay. They are composed of his research into the language of the Uyo. It seems remarkably similar to the writing you found hidden in the dodecahedron puzzle box. Read them over carefully, see if it sparks a memory. Updated my journal. As you read over Finn Andley's notes regarding the lost language of the Uyo, Uyo, there is a throbbing sensation in your temples as a memory begins to surface. Memories of this language. You recall letters, words, phrases, until, like a spire wind blowing away the blanket of poisonous smog over the great foundry, the language is once more revealed to you in its entirety. You should be able to read the writing in the dodecahedron now. You have the odd gray dodecahedron up to examine it carefully. Now aware of the various deadly traps it holds for the incautious user and how to avoid them entirely. Having learned the dead language of the Uyo, Uyo you'll at last be able to decipher its contents. Hold the dodecahedron. The tablet turns out to be a journal of sorts. 
one kept by some prior incarnation of yourself, it would seem. Not an altogether sane one, either. There are only a handful of completely coherent sections. What do you wish to read? About. Whispering shadows. The whispers are not the shadows moving. They are speaking, plotting, talking to each other. I can understand some of what they say. Read about a female ghost. The book tells me things, whispers things. It tells me to avoid the ghost girl, avoid her. I don't know her and she torments me. Read about so hiding something within your own body. So I swallowed it, hoping it'd catch in my bowels. I can make someone remove it when I need to. Paranoid ranting. I have learned that my life is not my own. I will not allow you to have my life. You will have to pull my life from my broken body if you want it. It's you who will die if I cannot have it, neither will you. You are responsible for this treason of flesh. You will not live to live my life. Cursed tattoos. The accursed tattoos will not leave my skin. I have tried to burn them off of my skin. Failed, failed. I try and cloak myself, but I always feel that people are reading my flesh, reading me like a book. Whenever they look at me, I want to tear their eyes out, pluck them from their sockets, and crush them beneath my heel. I read about dreams in Ravel. I used the goblet of Samir to force a waking dream. I saw a hag. She tempted me, threatened me with shadows. I have never seen her, but she came when I dreamt. I must not dream again. I must always be aware. I destroyed the, destroyed the goblet. She says she is someone of power and that she will have me, will find me. Get away, hag. Stay far away from me. Leave me in peace. I want nothing to do with you. Her voice reeked of evil's talons, talons like spiders. They burrowed into my great matter, and I needed her out of my mind. Out. Out, hag. She was a myth fairy tale who alone challenged the lady of pain how can one fight someone who is a myth i don't have the weapons i need weapons that will kill her should she find me i need a strategy so she cannot defeat me when she comes for me i must devise and think i shall beat her danger of names fear names names have power and identity names can be used as weapons by others they are a hook that can be used to track you find you hunt you across the plains Remain nameless, and you shall be safe. Read about the killing in the Fest Hall. I went to the Fest Hall, looking for the path of my false self in its halls. So glaring was it that those I did not know, the false ones, welcomed me into their confidence, treated me as a friend, showed me my room, attended to my needs. I had to restrain myself from launching out against them. That would have been premature. First, I needed to protect my identity. I found one who knew the exclusive language of the Uyo, learned it as I could, then killed him. Then I went to the sensorium and prepared to end the matter. Soon. Soon. There is nothing he can do. Memories are gone. He says, never to return. He says and lies and says flash lies and tells me that this is what he told me lies he says my mind is weakening from every death lies he sat there betraying my confidence with every turn he says that only after three more deaths three more lives will i gain the benefit of keeping my memories that i myself i will die when i die die how can one be immortal and still die he could not answer so he was of no use i butchered him so that no other incarnation will ever benefit from his uselessness Read a cryptic answer from an unknown source. So the ghastly head said, You have been divided. You are one of many men. One in many men? You bear many names. Each has left their scars on your flesh. Lost one. Immortal one. Incarnation's end. Man of a thousand deaths. The one doomed to life. Restless one. One of many. The one whom life holds prisoner. The bringer of shadows. The wounded one. Misery bringer, Yemeth. You are silvered glass that is cracked and the pieces scattered across his across history. Only one piece is of import. Regain that and your life will be yours again. There will be a price. This price will buy you a chance. Without the chance, 
you are doomed. You have lost which that is never meant to be separated from man. Your mortality has been stripped from you. Lost. It exists, but you must find it before your mind is lost to you as well. Read something about a legacy. A legacy, the note read. Forget not to collect your legacy in a small code scratched beside it. 51 AA. A trap, no doubt, set by yet another of my false selves. I'll see it destroyed, I will. Journal away. I'm gone. 51 AA. Diligence gives you a look of utter revulsion. Did I not demand that you stay clear of me? I warned you that I would summon the guard. Lady Diligence, wait. I beg of you. I fear I did not show the proper respect for you when we last met. I hope you'll accept my apologies. After a moment, she gives an exasperated sigh. I can see by your manner you are well educated, sir, yet you appear to insist upon a lifestyle of wandering and senseless violence. Why not settle in sigil, become a contributing citizen, rather than some bloody hand and nomad in its streets? The choice is out of my hands, I assure you. Oh, how so? Her coldness melts away into a look of curiosity. Tell her your story, or what you know of it. Diligence looks shocked. That, that is quite a tale, sir. Were it only a tale, madam. Were it only a tale, madam. It is my life, and I have the scars to prove it, as you noted when we first met, I believe. Yes. Yes, quite so. She smiled slightly. You had begun to wonder if she was even capable of such a thing. I wish you luck, sir, in your undertakings. May you find yourself once more. Thanks. I did have some questions. She, she shakes her head. I'm afraid I'm a busy woman, sir. My position as fourth magistrate leaves me little time with which to answer your questions. I am sure another citizen could help you, however. Farewell, then, Lady Diligence. See Quentin, he's still studying the rock as if he could topple it with his gaze. Greetings, Quentin. Eh, Quentin throws you a glance that nods. Well, Medigan Cutter, come to claim Sliceless Rock for your name? Not yet, has some questions for you. Ever know anybody who came back after their name was carved here? You mean come back from death? Quentin shakes his head. Not a one, Cutter. Everything that's t that lives dies, and that's the way of things. He shrugs, still considering the planes go on forever, and all I suppose anything's possible. The fanged woman, uh, okay. Death of names. You see a dustman with a crooked smile frozen on his face. Despite the smile, his eyes are as dull as stones. His right arm is shorter than the left, and he keeps it tucked to his side, as if cradling a small child. Greetings. The dustman's eyes slide over you. Name. The way he speaks the word, it sounds like the tolling of a bell. I, I don't know. No name. No name. Can't help you. The dustman speaks in a curious sing-song voice. Need to give a name if you want to see where it's died. Updated my journal. Give, 
given a name when you're born, give it back when you need it no more. Death of names, death of names, as I swim around across the monolith and the walls of the area. Buried many names here, death of names has. Tell me a name, I'll show its grave. Ayanara. His eyes roll to the back of his head, then pop back. With a wild gleam, his eyes run across the walls of the monument, scanning the names at inhuman speed. Points Then points out a section of the wall. Buried. Chiseled into the black stone, tiny cramped writing is the name you requested. It is almost lost underneath the sea, beneath the sea of names around it. I'd like to bury a name. Doll. Shakes his head. Not dead yet, that name is. Not buried here. Not time, not time. Can you bury a name for me? Doll. Oh, my ten. Okay, wrong area. Questions. You see a trim, muscular man dressed in clothing that is comparatively drab and mundane compared to most of the outfits you've seen in this city. He carries himself with an air of supercilious arrogance. He also looks dramatically out of place here. What do you want? He asks. Who are you? I am Elias, warrior of renown. Surely you have heard of me. No. Can it truly be? Can it truly be that none in this town have heard of me or my exploits? Alas, I shall have to prove myself all over again. And here I have thought my fame had spread across the world. I'm certain it has. Answer some questions for me, will you? Okay. At last, not everyone here is entirely ignorant. I shall allow you to buy me a drink. And then we can trade stories. I shall regale you with my latest adventures, including the tale of how I came to this most wondrous dismaying city. Where are you from? How did you get here? I come from the city of Aliburn on the River Tyne. Surely you, you have heard of its glories and wonders? No matter, no matter. This place is benighted and ignorant when it comes to the splendors of true cities. I am told that my land is what is called a prime by the denizens of the city, though a prime of what? I don't know. How did you get here? I was chasing my old foe, the villainous life shade, Tur Tanilel. Pauses, waiting for acknowledgement, and then continues. He conjured his demonic magic and opened a, himself a doorway and hurled himself through it. Before he could flee me entirely, I threw myself after him. I found myself here. I get it, you're one of the clueless. He bristles, reddening, and his hand clutches convulsively around the hilt of his sword. Clueless, is it? I take offense to your words, Surah. And bid you farewell in the hopes that we should never again cross paths again. He turns away from you, still flushed with pride and rage. I'd like to then be, he sighs heavily and eyes with disdain. Then be on with it, scarred one. Ask can be done. I'd like to apologize to you. He appears entirely shocked, as if the notion of apologies is alien to him. You wish to apologize? That's what I said. Then, and then I suppose as a point of honor, I must accept your apology. Very well. In return, I offer my apology as well. Let us set the matter aside and speak no more of it. Okay. Okay. 
Okay. That's where... I'm gonna end it for tonight. Making some progress. Still... At a loss as to how to get some water from the river Styx. But... I'll figure it out. So, yeah, that's it. Thank you all for watching. Have a good night. I'll be back tomorrow with Pokemon Yellow. Gonna aim to finish that up. Go through Cerulean Cave. Get Mewtwo. And then maybe uh, take on the Pokemon League and beat the champion again. But either way, that's it for tonight. Thank you all for watching. Have a good night. And I'll see you all tomorrow. Bye-bye.